So I think we can start now. Uh, first of all, I want to I want to thank uh, Mr. Sergio for accepting our request and being interested in helping us. So during the webinar, I'll be the coordinator. If you have any questions, you can ask your questions by opening your microphone, or you can ask your questions at the end of the webinar. Um, so, Mr. Sergio, stage is yours. You can start. From now on. Thanks a lot. Good evening. Good morning for those of you who are in the same continent that I am. Uh, let me give you a, an idea about what we're going to do today. Hold on, because this is not moving along. Okay. So thanks a lot for your interest in, in listening this presentation. Uh, this actually happened back in 2015, and Javid and Isel and all these the, the people from the student chapter know where to find the original recording of this presentation. There is a recording in English and also in Spanish. And as far as I know, this will also be recorded. Yes. So the title is uh, Seismic Bandwidth Extension and Resolution Improvement. And the whole point was to talk about what works. And first of all, let me tell you what happened since 2015. And the logo of the Society of Exploration, Exploration Geophysics is changed. The logo of the place where I work also changed. And the name of the lecture was modified to honorary lecture in Latin America. Before that, it was Central and South America. And we're still missing the Caribbean, but that's little by little. That's how we get more and more global. This happened as 24 talks, three of them in Argentina, seven in Brazil, five in Colombia, one in Venezuela, one in Trinidad and Tobago, one in Mexico. All of them were presential. Eight of them were in English. And this is the first virtual in your, in your hometown, in Baku, Azerbaijan. And this will be the ninth time that I, that I present this in English. Hopefully it will be clear. Hopefully it will be easy for us to communicate and bug me anytime when it comes to questions and hopefully we will have some time to discuss. I will speed it up. I will skip a few slides. And again, bug me if you need to get something clarified. Yeah. This, this was the, the session of acknowledgements at the time, and I have to do it very quickly. SEG and the SEG Foundation has been essential to sponsor this process. Shell also participated, and Pemex Exploration and Production, because they funded my work, they gave access to the data, they allow us to use it, and for publication permission. I propose you as a candidate for this kind of activity, so I have to thank the two names that you see here. Two people from SEG who helped me with the whole process, publicity, materials, and so on. My co-workers and former students, in particular Mario Centeno, the guy highlighted in orange, and my mentors and friends in the US and abroad. There are some names over there that you will probably recognize. And of course, the local people from your workplace who supports your work, who believes in you, and those usual mentors and friends that we all have. And finally, to my wife. Before showing you the outline, what has happened in terms of publications or new activities or new technologies? From a sister society, the European Association of Geoscientists and Engineers, there is a special issue from January this year 
that deals with land seismic. And you can see in the, in the red rectangle that increasing the resolution has always been the goal of any seismic technology from acquisition till the end. So if you have the chance, take a look at that uh, short paper. It's a rather recent paper. In addition, SEG just published last month, also in January, a special section on seismic resolution. That's from the leading edge. So this topic is all the time a hot topic. It is something that uh, remains as one of the fundamentals of what I need to know about seismic exploration. And in particular, if you want to know more details about the topic from this latest issue from the leading edge, there is this overview by very famous industry people in which they also describe in the, in the red rectangle, improvements in resolution do not depend on a single process of the seismic workflow, but on multiple interconnected components, including acquisition, processing, imaging, and interpretation yeah. methods and technologies. And that's what I will try yeah. to describe very quickly. That's essentially what we did back in 2000, yeah. of all of these components. This is the outline. Apart from the introduction that I already began with, there will be a section of seismic bandwidth extension, examples from frequency enhancement with marine seismic data sets. Then we will continue with numerical tests with synthetic data. And finally, a summary and questions. This all began back in 2006 when people from PMEX ask me and, and my little team of, of students if we could do something in terms of, of improving vertical resolution with a particular data set that at the time was not yet considered a, a, a fundamental field, but a very relevant field because it was part of what we used to begin calling unconventional. I will get back to this one in a few more minutes, but that's how it all began back in 2006. And typically the industry people ask you to attack a particular problem. Let's go to the basic idea. This is a very nice plot depicting on the horizontal axis, the maximum vertical resolution and on the vertical axis, the reservoir coverage. You can see all the different scales when you have cores, when you have wireland logs, sonic logs. It's, get, it's getting more complicated when you go into the crosswell seismic technology, the vertical seismic profiles, and the surface seismic. So surface seismic only lets you take a look at tens of meters and above. If you want to see smaller scales, you have to go into the left of the plot. And, and this is the, the dream of every, every geophysicist, this blue gap between the log information and the surface information. That's usually not available. And you can see on the right, the different resolution coming out from the different measurements from 3D, BSP to surface seismic. It is pretty different what we're able to, to depict and represent from the subsurface. This is a textbook example modified from Clairbout, one book that I always recommend and most of my mentors always recommend. The typical frequency band for surface, surface seismic is between 10 and 100 hertz. The horizontal axis is frequency the vertical axis is qualitative. It, it says accuracy. So we never get velocities up to 100% and we never get an estimation of the reflectivity, uh, not even as 50 or 60%. We always get an estimation of what we call reflectivity. 
And in the low frequency part, we call it velocity. And there is a gap between two and 10 Hertz. And that's essentially the information we're, al we're always missing or we tend to miss from surface experiments. The gap, the, the gap between two and 10 Hertz has been filling up during the last years due to the availability of low frequency data, which is depicted with the, with the yellow line and the improvement of velocity estimation through tomography. Tomographic velocities are filling up that gap from the left to the right. And there is this dream about extending the frequency content. But before going into that, and that's coming from acquisition. Conventional data is between 10 and 80 Hertz. What we call broadband data is between two and 150 Hertz. And for the future is going below one Hertz and going above 200 Hertz. But that's still kind of a dream. And we'll discuss this very, very quickly. So this is Mark, that's what we're going to talk about. It's, it's an exercise that lots of companies have tried, lots of service companies still offer. And that's something we have to demystify. We'll, we'll show you that it's relatively easy, pretty straightforward to actually extend the frequency band. But the implication is, does that really help you? Is that really what you need? So I'll... I'll, I'll go into that for the remaining of the presentation. The definition that we always see in the textbooks that probably all of you have seen are the typical examples with a wedge and resolution definitions. There are criteria. On the right, you can see the Rayleigh, the Rayleigh criterion, the Rickers criterion, and the Wydes criterion which is a factor of lambda, the dominant, the predominant wavelength. This is from, from a text example, the famous GILMAS. So you can see how velocity, frequency, and resolution gets modified. And everything depends on the frequency that you injected into the ground, the velocity of the subsurface, and the predominant wavelength. The, those are the main the main variable. We can easily estimate from just looking at a seismic section, we can estimate from a trough to trough or peak to peak separation as depicted on the right. We can estimate what we call the tuning thickness in meters or the tuning thickness in seconds. Even though it says thickness, we call it in seconds or meters depending on the seismic section, if it is either in time or in depth. Again, this is a text, but it is as simple as this to estimate vertical resolution. For a summary of all these fundamentals and comments, I included this reference. At the end of the presentation that is freely available to any interested party, David already has a copy. You can bug him or you can bug me and we'll send you a copy of what you're, you're, what you're looking at. And this is one good reference listed at the end. Ah, now concerning seismic bandwidth extension. This is kind of the overview that I described at the beginning. And that was something I read from one of the review papers from the of the leading edge. So the whole process is during acquisition, during processing, during imaging, and also during post-processing. And for most people, interpretation is, is, is made during the post-processing stage. In the lower portion of the <inaudible> plot, you see... <inaudible> Can you please uh, turn off your microphones? Thank you. So in the bottom, in the bottom of this plot, you see this is this qualitative line from best to worst. It is a wish list. The best, 
the most relevant portion where you would need to improve resolution would be during acquisition. Later on, you fix what you can during processing. Later on, you do it during the imaging portion, and you can also do it at the end during the post-processing part. And as I said, that's typically where most people tend to work in the post-stack domain, not in the pre-stack domain. Let's start with acquisition. There we have three techniques listed, the variable depth the streamer, the over under tau the streamer, and the dual sensor tau the streamer. I will go through these very quickly. I will skip a few plots. Again, everything is recorded and you can bug me anytime. The main problem during marine data acquisition has to do with ghosts. You, the, you can see the depiction of the source ghost and the receiver ghost. That, those are the main nightmare for marine data acquisition because they tend to blur the images, they tend to contaminate the data, so we have to clean the data. This is the typical experiment. You have the source and you have the receivers. The white line is the is the the bottom of the experiment. And this is one quick example of a primary event. Below, you can see this response as an impulse. And on the right, you, you can see the frequency content. The typical frequency content of, of an impulse is the whole, the whole spectrum, the whole, it, it is a flat spectrum. Now, if you have a, you have one one ghost, as you can see there on the on the plot. Take a look at the frequency content on the right, and you start having a spectral notches. You can you can see that the spectrum is not flat anymore, and that's due just to the to the ghost. If we get more, if we get more ghosts, sorry, I had a, a problem here with sounds. If we have more ghosts, as it is depicted in this in this uh, image, you can see that there are more spectral notches and there are more problems just due to the presence of the ghost. How can we? take a look at this and fix the problem. And that's what the data acquisition companies do. This is uh, the typical example of the boat, the sea surface, the streamer. And if you want to estimate the streamer depth, which is something they control quite well, one example is what about doing this at 7.5 meters, which is the streamer part. And the problem is there is a lower signal to noise ratio. And the, the frequency content is depicted in this plot. It is kind of a flat uh, response between 20 and 80 Hertz, but this gets spoiled if, as we will notice here. What if the streamer goes deeper, say 35 meters? There is greater signal to noise ratio but there are all these problems with the, spec with the spectral notches. So the, the spectrum is not flat. So how, how do the companies fix all this? I listed these three examples. See, this is a partial list, the over under, the dual sensor and the variable depth of the streamer and the companies that actually do this. Most of them seem to be offering the same, even though the marine data acquisition business has changed a lot since 2015. This is a quick example of the over and under tau the streamer. So they use two cables, two streamers, one above the other one. And the whole thing is to fix all these spectral notches, to fix all these problems with the, with the spectrum. And this is a quick example. 
the black line depicts the over and under experiment for a streamer depth of 18 and 25 meters. The other plots are particularly for a different depth. And you, you can see how the, there is this reinforcement of the frequency response. You can also do things like this, and you probably know about this. There are also measurements doing dual sensors. By dual, it means that one of the sensors is the typical hydrophone, and the other one is a geophone. And the, the plot on the, on the left depicts what happens when you remove, when you remove the ghost. And on the right, you can see what happens in the frequency spectrum. So you get rid of all these spectral notches, all these problems. And the whole thing is to hopefully flatten as much as possible the frequency content. And the whole idea is also depicted here. You have pressure, velocity, and the upgoing pressure because you sum this, this re, these responses from the geophone and the hydrophone. And again, what, you, what we want to achieve is to flatten the spectrum. You don't need to be a geologist or a geophysicist to realize that the plot on the right is much better than the plot on the left. It looks nicer to your eyes. And this is an example of removing ghosts. There is also the variable depth streamer. This is kind of a trickier one. It is much more difficult to explain and describe, but the experiment also achieves this flattening of the frequency response. And quickly, you can see there the degusted version on the right as compared with the previous version. In this case, there is a mirror cable, which is uh, virtual, and the migration example, and then the improvement once we, we apply the convolution. This plot is from publicity. This is one particular solution that CGG used to offer, and, and I think it still offers. And again, you don't need to be an expert to realize that the plot on, on the right is much better than the plot on the left. One criticism that companies get is that this high resolution is limited to shallow events. That's a problem for some of the oil companies. And I, I will skip this portion. I think it is plots it has to do with the combination with synchronized sources you can also we can also improve this flattening by using a combination of uh, of of guns of synchronizing the the sources for this marine marine example let me skip this one and let me quickly go to the land portion this was a dream let's say 10 years before. Now vibrators can even vibrate down to one hertz, which is essentially an earthquake frequency. And they can go all the way up to 250 hertz. And you can see the effect quickly on the right, depending on this modification and going to lower frequencies, you can see a bit more with the, with the land data, which is usually way more complicated than the marine data. Now let's go to the processing part. So you probably hear a lot about reprocessing and people do a lot of careful preconditioning and a lot of reprocessing. This is getting a bit lost because most people want to go into depth migration and they forget that everything depends on the time processing prior to the depth migration process. Just two quick examples. One of them has to do with the convolution. Uh, on the left, it is one marine example. Uh, and on the right, again, you don't have to be an expert to realize that the plot on the right is better than the one on the left. And the only thing here was to clean the bubbles from the signal. It was a debubble, the convolution. 
So not only ghost, but also bubbles are a problem with the marine acquisition. This other example is from land, and it's a typical and relevant field that I showed in one of the early plots in Mexico. The two white lines depict the top and the bottom of this particular formation. And you can easily notice the difference between the upper and lower plot. And you can see the frequency enhancement on the right. There are a couple of uh, amplitude spectrum. The blue one was the original frequency content. The orange one is the modified frequency content. And all they did was just to reprocess way more carefully the land data set. And it is a very complicated, small, but relevant data set for the company, which is Pimex. Now, imaging. You hear a lot about the convolution. You hear a lot about migration. You hear a lot about all the fancy techniques where, where, where processing takes a lot of time. Let's just give a quick look. Uh, this is the example that I mentioned at the beginning that was back in 2008, published in the leading edge. And we use something we call migration deconvolution. In this case, we improve vertical and lateral resolution. Whenever we talk about migration, we will improve lateral resolution. And as sort of a recipe, when you do the convolution, you're improving vertical resolution. This is the before and after, and you can notice the difference. You can see, you can see this sort of quasi-vertical uh, events that disappear in the bottom portion of the plot. And in this case, however, the plot on, on the right, which is the after, there, there is some ringing that is not uh, that good, but but we got some confidence in terms of the comparison with the, with the well information, with the synthetic data information. I mean, sorry, with the uh, one dimensional uh, seismogram that we are comparing from the wells. Thinking about migration, reverse time migration, RTM, some of these names that you, you hear about pretty often in the publicity and the papers. At that time, back in 2014, there was this broadband least squares reverse time migration. You can see the frequency content on the lower portion of the, of the plot. And the, the, the improvement is, is much better. Just compare A, B, and C. Again, you don't need to be an expert to realize that C is better than A and B. This is a very time consuming process. It's a very fancy process. It's a, it's a product that we, we all would like to try with our data. Keep it in mind, reverse time migration, least square migration. It is as depicted on the upper right plot, it is an iterative image process. One more example from the, from the, the bubble part. But it's just to remember that we already show this plot. And this is the example when people use multiples. Most of the images you have seen coming out from imaging include only primaries. They assume there are no multiples. But some of the fancy techniques also include multiple information, which was typically considered as noise. If we modify the imaging condition, we can represent the subsurface even with multiples. And this is a quick example from 2015. Now let's go to post-processing. This is closer to the school stage where you are at. And it is, this is more typical for young people, for, for people who, who are working for small companies or even for big companies. You are at the post-processing stage. You only receive one volume of information. You cannot necessarily modify the volume. You don't have access to the pre-stag information. You don't see the field records anymore. And you only have a volume of seismic data. And there are a bunch of uh, names on the right highlighted by yellow. Derivatives, phase multiplier, 
Lubric convolution, spectral blueing, wavelet transfer, reflectivity inversion, structure-oriented filtering plus spectral balancing. Now that's notice that this is the worst part where we will improve resolution, but this is what we have to deal with. Most of us deal with seismic data at this particular stage. So I will give you a quick overview about a few of these techniques. Back in 2015, and still during these days, most of these companies, some of them uh, were bought by, by bigger companies. These were the service companies that uh, offered the bandwidth extension uh, packages, different flavors, different techniques. The aim was the same, to extend the frequency bandwidth. I have no reason to say something good or bad, or bad about any of them. They all do the best they can. What we just tried to do with this presentation was essentially demystify how complicated or how easy it is to do this. So let's go quickly to spectral blueing, which is the most accepted technique in this case. Why it is accepted? Because in this case, you have to, to, to design a blueing operator depicted in the bottom portion. In the upper portion, you estimate the average spectral amplitude from your surface data. On the right, you have to estimate the average well log reflectivity. With that, you design a blowing operator and you do modify the frequency content from the data you have at hand. You can see quickly here, the original data and the spectral blowing data. And these, these arose in the early 2000s. BP was a company that used to do this, and I guess they still do it. And this is the most accepted technique. One rather fancy academic uh, package, the one coming out from the University of Oklahoma, includes this in, in their competitions. And they wrote this really interesting paper from an, another sister society, which is the AAPG Explorer, where AAPG is the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. And the paper is simply called, uh, Am I Blue? And if you, realize, if you are asking yourself why blue, it's because we are tending to go to the, to the high frequencies. And that's why, that's why the sky is blue, because it actually lets, lets the light is only passed through the high frequency part. Now, there are these derivatives, phase multiplying and structure-oriented filtering plus spectral balancing. Let's take a look at this very quickly. And this is part of the frequency enhancement with marine seismic data sets. The marine data comes from Pimex, the Mexican national company. What we quickly, quickly, what we call a structure oriented filtering began in the early 2000s as one of the main efforts about uh, automation of seismic interpretation. Everyone has been interested for over 20 years to automate velocity estimation at the time processing stage and seismic interpretation. So it's not, it's not surprised that this has been tried for over 20 years. On the left, original data. On the right, data after being a structurally oriented filter. It essentially follows the structural trend of the data. The whole thing is to highlight these continuities and to enhance, to emphasize what we call reflections and reflectors. This is data from one of the main fields in Mexico. This was the original, and this was the process data. Some people like this plot, some people don't, because we're essentially losing the low frequency. So remember that reality is independent of our desires and emotions. So we get high frequencies, but we lose low frequencies. So people who ask us to do this exercise got excited and at the same time they got disappointed, but it works. Using an academic uh, seismic processing package essentially focused for seismic attributes. 
This is what happens to the original spectrum. And on the right, you see the frequency enhancement and the, you actually enrich the high frequencies as well. The phase multiplier comes from the idea of, of the complex seismic trace. Uh, here is where you have to recall your, your fundamentals of complex variables. The definition is, is the first equation. And the whole thing was proposed by Stark, and he uses a, a phase multiplier. Uh, actually, if you multiply the phase, you increase the frequency content. And instead of spending too much time on this plot, let me show it to you with plots. This is another data set. This is the original one. When the phase multiplier is one, you get the same data. When the, same, when the phase multiplier is two, look at the difference. And when the phase multiplier is three, this even looks like, like modern art. So it, it even looks uh, weird because this is very cosmetic. Okay, you are increasing the frequency content. But now it's, it doesn't really look that much geological to you anymore. And this is what happens to the frequency content. It looks weird. You increase frequencies all the way above the typical surface seismic uh, frequency, frequency band. And again, it, it starts looking, looking pretty weird. But it's pretty easy to do it. Any of you could easily do this processing. One more example, same data set. You can play with this. You can say, well, let's add n equal one and n equal three. And let's just keep adding. And things start looking pretty nice, but again, less geological. I will say a few more things about this particular example in, in the synthetic data portion. Look at the frequency spectra. So you become skeptical. How come the data that I didn't have at the beginning is now so rich in frequency content? And this is also something that you, most of you probably know because you have seen it in data processing courses. What happens when I apply the second and the fourth derivative to the data? The derivative behaves as a high frequency filter. So you get rid of the low frequency part. It is easier to compute in the frequency domain. You can see the formulas there. And again, just to do this quicker, let me show you the plots. This is the original data set. And this is what you get after applying the negative, just to correct for the polarity, the negative of the second derivative, the before and the after, before and after. Again, interpreters get excited because now they can see more things that they, they were expecting to see, but then you're also boosting the noise. So it's not that straightforward. You're boosting signal, but you're also boosting noise. And you can notice some of those kind of crappy events that are look kind of flat in, in this portion. Below, below where it says second, you can see some weird flat events. So not every, as I said, Reality is independent of our desires and emotions. Not everything happens the way we want it. And this is the modification for the original and the process frequency band. Yes, we increase high frequency, things look nicer, and we just applied a second derivative and fix for polarity by applying a minus one to the whole volume. Uh, this kind of uh, gets even more complicated, more interesting, or, or even weirder, depending on how you feel, when you compare this and you correlate with well data. These are synthetics using the second derivative and phase multiplier and the target area. And we know nothing about the information, it's not relevant. We just compare with, with the target area. And actually, uh, one of the people I know that used this information, they did like the phase multiplier for whatever reason. 
Now let's go to the numerical tests with synthetic data. And I'm trying to speed it to speed up just to come up with with uh, be able to answer some questions and discuss briefly at the end. I'm going back to the typical canonical example. We have a wedge and we want to discuss the concept of resolution. And as a reminder, there are several criteria to define what's good or what is bad. The widest, the Ricker, and the Rayleigh uh, resolution criteria. What we mean by being resolved or unresolved is depicted in the lower portion of this synthetic data based on the wedge depicted on the upper portion. The red rectangle depicts the, the resolution, the part where you are able to resolve. There is a limit depicted by the red rectangle. Beyond the red rectangle, you unresolve the wedge. You only get one event instead of getting two events, like the ones you can clearly, clearly see on the left. That's the whole point. How can we distinguish between two different events? Once it gets lost, once we confuse the upper with the lower event as just one single event, we are not resolving the data. So what happens when we apply this, this idea to the derivatives, to the second and the fourth derivative applied to the synthetic data set? Now the, the red rectangle is the original resolution and the blue rectangle is the new resolution. And here you can tell that you're actually improving the vertical resolution in both cases, the second and the fourth. This does not happen with the phase multipliers. This is for the case of n equal to and n equal three. And notice that the red and the blue rectangles are still the same. So there is no increment of resolution. There is only increment of frequency content. And that can be done as easily as modifying the phase once we take the data into the frequency domain, or we can use fancier techniques like the, the ones offered by some of the companies that I listed or different more recent service companies. And for the other examples that, that we tried, the sum of n equal one, n equal three, and the sum of one, three, and five, there is no frequency. I mean, there is no resolution improvement. The resolution remains the same, even though the, the, the data looks better because it has more, more uh, frequency content. So what is the, as you notice, we are close to the end and, and I will be very happy to, to discuss everything you want. So what can we tell about this? How can we summarize what we just described? So frequency enhancement, typically done with bandwidth extension, in fact, does ease interpretation. But there is this bias that may arise due to the cosmetic improvement that we get and as as we clearly saw in the synthetic part. We all get fooled by the frequency content improvement. We all feel like there is much more geology. We all feel there is more stratigraphy. But the, the bottom line is this does not necessarily imply or much less guarantee that there is a vertical resolution improvement. Again, this is the main take from the presentation. This is the overview we tried to, to give students and professionals back in 2015. And hopefully I was able to convey the equivalent message to all you guys in, in Baku and wherever you, you are with the other people that were invited and, and hopefully joined this. Thanks a lot. Thank you too. Thank you for your time. Oh, my pleasure. Any comments? Any questions?
description. Javid has a copy of the presentation. You can ask him or you can bug me and we'll send you a copy if you're interested. This was already, uh, this is available also in the original version in the SEG website uh, in English and in Spanish. What else do we do, Javid? Is Javid around? Yes, I'm muted in. Oh, okay. Connection problems connect now. Oh, no problem. No problem. You are the boss. Tell me if there are questions, comments, or sorry for my internet connection uh no so uh, so guys do you have any question uh mr for mr sergio if you have any question don't hesitate asking your questions because it's a great chance for me with sergio and asking him about anything we would like like in from geophysics from this presentation because um maybe you have some questions It is also valid Hi. to say oh. you didn't get anything, no problem. <laughs> Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Well, I'll certainly, hey, this, this is Raul. Um, I have nice a question. Uh, uh -huh. what, what is your insight in, 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 in terms of how to use these uh, bandwidth extension methodologies to improve quality of seismic that uh, which applications go beyond just exploration, um, that you go into quantitative analysis and particularly into um, applications for production? One, one, one good reply could be that uh, if you incorporate the well data information as described with the bluing operator, with the bluing process, that might be the best option to use for the production part. So incorporate the seismic, incorporate the well data information, estimate your operator, and you get a much better result. That's one thing I've seen even within PMEX. Of course, BP has done it a lot, but that, that could be a quick reply to what, to what you asked me. And, and nice, nice having you here. Thanks. Uh, thank you for, for the um, presentation. It was, it was great material. Thank you, Raul. There is something on the chat. Ah, okay. Don't don't be shy. Yes, guys, please. If you have any questions, I believe you have so many questions, but you are hesitating to ask it. But just feel free to ask anything you want uh, regarding to geophysics, geoscience, this presentation. And don't be shy. We are too far. No one is going to slap you or anything. No one will hit you. Hello, everyone. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, General, my major in geology, I have graduated from Baku State University and uh, I would like to take uh, geology, so geoscience courses. Which courses can I take? Uh, please, if it's possible, could you recommend me? Just uh, please repeat the final portion of your question. I hear that you are a geologist, but what kind yes. of courses in which particular? Uh, especially geoscience. Uh, it doesn't matter for me, geology, geoscience, geophysics, hydrogeology, it doesn't matter for me. I would like to take courses, and, but I don't know which course. Okay. And you're a geologist, but you don't know where to go. I mean, but you don't know where to go. It could be oil, it could be something else. Uh, yes. Also, I applied uh, BP for uh, a career, graduate science. Okay. Yes, and therefore uh, I would like to improve my special technical skills related 
geology, geoscience, structural geology, or geological mapping, and so. Okay. Well, let me praise you and let me give you some suggestions. Your English is very good, so let me praise that part. And the question you ask is, is something I, I get asked all the time, and it is, it is very relevant. So what am I going to do? So how, how do I, what do I do to improve myself? And the answer you would get from people like Raul, the guy who asked me a question, from people like me, who are older than you, is polish your fundamentals, follow your instinct. If you want to be a better geologist, you have to be able to communicate with us, the geophysicists, and that will get you farther in any area where you go. The difficult problem when geologists try to communicate with geophysicists usually lies on data processing techniques. Like when I mentioned the frequency content or the frequency domain, geologists do not always take courses on those particular topics. And geophysicists tend to take more mathematics, more physics, and that's why they seem to speak like they knew more things than the geologist. But we are very dumb when it comes to communicating with you, the geologist. So if I were you, I would just follow my instincts, whatever feels closer to your heart or your interest. And the fundamentals will apply to oil exploration, water exploration, you name it. Fundamentals like the ones we discussed today, uh, we all need them. And they are not as complicated to learn and grasp as some other really fancy, fancy things. Am I explaining myself? Am I telling you something meaningful? Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much. Thank you for your uh, attention, for your understanding. Uh, that was um, useful information for me. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot for your time and your question. And as I said, lots of younger people, lots of young people, even the old ones like me, uh, get confused and say, what the hell am I going to do next? Because we, none of us knows, and mostly in these complicated times. And sometimes we feel we have to choose something that will lead us to the successful portion of my career that I'm dreaming with. But all this process tends to be very slow. And the best comment I, I can highlight is focus on the fundamentals. Improve your English, improve your math, improve your physics, improve your communication skills. And again, thanks for asking something that I consider very, very relevant. And it's pretty much something I have to answer on an almost daily basis with lots of people, people like you, who will be the future of our, of our business. Thanks, uh, Gunel. Did I pronounce your name Thank correctly? Yes, yes, Gunel, okay. Gunel, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, we have a uh question from the chat so you can ask your question just take this thing in here or you can open your hello. microphone hello can you hear me perfectly yes, Great. yes. thank you uh thank you my name is umberto um i want to talk i uh, want to thank dr Chavez for the presentation i think he gave a very thorough and an in point presentation um, I just wanted to actually add a little comment. I've read a paper recently. I think it was published in 2019 or 2010 or 2020 uh, that goes into the subject. It's on the SCG library. And it's by Dr. Liang uh, from the University of Houston. And, and it's called Frequency Invention. It's very interesting because it goes through this and other methods of how to enhance the frequency content and how that does not mean enhancing resolution, which is aligned with what Dr. Chavez is saying. Um, and it has a series of synthetic testing and a series of models to, to check 
which uh, methods work well or not. He goes in depth into frequency acceleration, phase, deconvol uh, phase acceleration, frequency deconvolution, um, it's inversion, and other methodology that I highly recommend. Um, I think that was my comment. It's really interesting literature that goes aligned with, with what the chat is, with what the presentation is about. Thank you, Umberto. And actually, the paper you're referring to mm -hmm. nicely refers to this presentation. Yes, it does. It does yes. align they, very well. They, they to refer you. to this person. It's one of the few papers I've seen mm -hmm. when they refer to this presentation as, as a discussion of what uh, what the aim of the mm -hmm. of the presentation was. So what yeah, happens yeah. when you extend the bandwidth? Does it really make any sense? Correct. And the and the guy who proposed the the phase multiplier, the title of the paper is kind of funny because uh, let me quickly let's see. Let me quickly go to that. This reference. Stark. Mm -hmm. At the end, he asked the question: Is this a joke wizardry attribute? Because uh, that, that's that's part of like, what the hell is this? Okay, we are able to extend the frequency, but does it mean something, right. or is it just joke wizardry? Uh, and that's that's essentially the realm of of uh, lots of the papers dealing with the extension every year. Uh, I belong to the geophysics editorial team, and every year you see papers being published on this topic, and they keep getting more, they keep, they keep getting fancier and nicer, because they are theoretical, and you see the formulas, and they get something really nice, but then the whole, everything boils down to the question, does this really help me? And there are lots of companies who have paid good money for obtaining these services. And one gets skeptical if they really, if they are really able to solve the problem. So they get more information, it looks nicer, but do they really solve the problem? Thanks again for your comment. Thank you, Umberto. No, thank you. Hello, uh, I have a question. Can you hear me? Sure. Thank you. Uh, okay, my name is Murad. I'm applied yes. mathematics uh, student. And in one slide in your presentation, by the way, it was interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, you Thank talked you. about complex seismic trace. And if I'm not mistaken, that formula is from uh, complex analysis in mathematics. And after that, I'm wondering uh, which mathematical topics, methods, or disciplines you often use in uh, your research in geophysics you or your um colleagues can can you uh, tell me about that uh -huh. you are referring to this equation uh, right well let, let me hopefully i will provide you with a quick answer uh i already mentioned to the lady that asked asked me before about uh, what to do next or what courses uh, should she take? If you're a bit familiar with the electrical engineering curriculum, some of our courses as geophysicists overlap with electrical engineers. And some of us think that if we hadn't studied geophysics, we, we would have probably studied electrical engineering because we deal with data processing courses we deal with frequency uh, domain concepts. We deal with complex variable courses. So that's why we take more math than geologists and more physics. Hopefully I'm explaining myself. In Latin America, if you want to become a geologist or a geophysicist, you don't go to the school of science, mostly in the older days. Uh, now there are degrees related to this in the School of Sciences, but usually we went to the schools of engineering. So we would take classes with several types of engineers, and that would be essentially signal processing, uh, 
advanced mathematics. And uh, that's it, pretty much. And we always had problems communicating with geologists because we felt we were closer to the physicists and the mathematicians, but we were not. We were only engineers. So you guys get a much more formal education in terms of uh, linear algebra, uh, vectorial spaces, vectorial analysis, differential uh, equations, yeah, differential equations. So we all have that. We all do that, and then we get like we feel we are getting fancier, but we are not. We are only learning a bit about data processing. So in a nutshell. Data processing is the main, the main communication link between electrical engineers, mathematicians, physicists, and geophysicists. And most of the data processing uh, improvements actually come from electrical engineers, physicists, and mathematicians who became involved with geophysics. Did that answer a bit of your question? The information? Yes, of course. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Tips are always welcome. I can send you the account number. Any comments? Hi, uh, is, uh, did you hear me? Sure, yes, we hear you well. Uh, yes, uh, first, thank you, Sergio, for the presentation. So uh, I have a, a question about the, the Raleigh and why this criteria, criteria? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I don't know what is difference between within them because uh, what is used for vertical resolution? You mean something coming out from these uh, definitions on the right? Yes. Okay. The three of them are, let's say, theoretical papers, theoretical descriptions. The Rayleigh's criterion comes from diffraction concepts. Ricker's criterion comes more from the geophysical practice as well as widest criterion. You can use pretty much anyone you want. It depends on your preference. Uh, you hear more about the lambda divided by four when it comes to numerical experiments and, and theoretical papers. And you hear more about the widest criterion which is because it, it came from the practice. But notice they are not that different. So for an engineer, for someone from the practice, lambda divided by four is not necessarily too damn different from to lambda divided by eight. Uh, it depends on the, that's why we have to refer to the source. If we are using the Rayleigh's, or the widest criteria. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. I don't sir. think I, re I I answered your question, but I tried oh. to answer. No, because yes, yes, essentially, yes. It, it's a matter of preference. Theoretical guys will always go for the Rayleigh criteria. Theoretical guys, kind of half practical, will go for the Rickers criteria. And the wholly practical people will go for the lambda divided by eight. So as usual, it's a matter of preference, the flavor you like. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Sergio. And again, there are references at the end, bug me, send me a, send Javi the question or me and we'll send you the presentation. In case some of you want to read something, feel free to bug us and we'll do what we can.
Any more customers asking questions? Actually, there's a question in the chat box. Oh, well, that's something from Jorge Guzman. So that's a guy who you notice he's he's having breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> he's the guy having breakfast. He's a, a widely experienced person. He retired from Pimex. He knows about a lot about data acquisition. We know each other, we respect each other a lot. He says, could you depend on the relation in frequency and phase regarding the techniques that you showed in frequency and phase? Let's see, let's see if I get the, the question. As I said, he's the guy having lunch, having breakfast or lunch. Uh, so he's, he's eating the cereal that I haven't eaten. Hello. Uh, Hi, I'm Sergio. Good uh -huh. morning to everybody. Uh, no, the, the, the thing is that it is, well, it is important for me and from my, um, how can I say, for me that it's not only that the frequencies need to be there, need to be there in phase. I mean, you know what I mean? Uh, okay okay I, I know exactly that, i think that, i know exactly what you mean and uh, hopefully in other hopefully words, what i will reply will make sense to, to to you and to most of you i'm showing the the equation that the the that was referred to in in the previous question the take a look at the first equation f of t is equal to a of t times e to the i theta of t. That's the, the presentation of, of a time series. So the complex part is in the exponent of the e to the i theta theta of t and i is the complex uh, yes complex unit uh, most of the data processing ignores phase most of the data processing focuses more on the amplitudes most of the interpretation focuses more on amplitude doing migration means you are playing with the phase. Once you do seismic migration, you are playing with the exponent part. Migration plays with the phase. That's something that lots of people do not know. But uh, it, it's the fundamental of seismic imaging, of seismic migration. So you mess with the phase, you get a better uh, focusing, a better focusing of the that you have in your seismic volume or your seismic data. And usually people try to be careful with the amplitude content. Oh, we're filtering, we did this and that, and we did not mm -hmm. compromise the amplitude that mm -hmm. much. But you mess the whole thing with the face, you destroy the face, you modify the face. And you notice how these uh, silly examples or basic examples like this, you can mess with the face very easily. It is very, very easy to modify the face. So the, the, the one thing that I could say quickly is we have to be careful with the face, but we don't do it. Most people don't realize all the modifications we're doing with the face. And some of, some of the improvements in seismic attributes do come from a much more careful treatment of the face. Like uh, the guys that I showed, I'll show this plot quickly. The, the guys that I showed before were, were in the paper where they, they say, am I blue? 
Marsilio, the second author, Marsilio Matos is a Brazilian guy. All his work focuses on is essentially phase wrapping, phase unwrapping, phase processing. And that's how they fix several things by playing with the phase. I have not a, I do not have a single answer, but that's that's one possible answer to your question. And, and you see papers, lots of tons of literature dealing with amplitude preservation. And that that that's what gets applied in, into the production part that Raul was asking earlier. But no one talks about phase preservation or phase processing or phase control. Hopefully I said something, something relevant. Oh, you, you, yes, you, you did. And I mean, it's very important. L long time ago, I saw in this, um, this, this presentation of this guy, in which he was playing with the face. I'm making an example on a picture and, and just by changing the face, the sharpening of the images disappear. So that, that makes me think a lot. And I, I, uh, since then I've been very worried about, about uh, the processing on the last time, of the last part of uh, what I was processing for a small company was trying to preserve and very much and no miss no, uh, no messing with the with the face so i think it's uh, it is important because what you say people always try to improve amplitudes and and things like that and forget about about the face and once you move the face things change a lot in a, in a seismic section and the interpretation of the seismic section can be very very much distinct and it is a it is an ongoing topic. And just thinking about the different public that we have, we have seasoned professionals like Jorge and I, and we have young people like the ones that asked before. There is a great uh, presentation. I, I think it is available in the SEG website. There is a great presentation dealing with what we are just talking about. And it is uh, by Professor Tad Ulrich. He, uh -huh. he already died. And his presentation has to do with face, a difficult concept, something we don't easily get because we're dealing with the complex domain. And we live in a real world. And, and the imaginary part, which is the main component of the face is something he discusses. Most of the thinking about the question made by my Murad, Murad or Munad, Murad, thinking about his question, uh, that, that's also something that joins the electrical engineers with the mathematicians, with the geophysicists and so on. So I will, I will just, just to finish my comment, I will write the name of the professor. Hopefully it is correct. Oh, hold on. Sorry. My dog. That's the name of the professor. He died. He was working in Canada. Uh, data processing guy, essentially a mathematician. But he gives a great presentation about face. That, that's all he cared about, the face. Thank you, Jorge. Anything else, Javid? I'm so happy. My pleasure, thank you. My pleasure. Oh, my, mine too. Thank you. So I set the name of the data processing guy to the WhatsApp group, and you can find it there also. And don't miss it. It is a great presentation. If you get curious about the topic, it is a great presentation. He was a great professor and a real gentleman. Sure. So guys, any more questions?
So it seems um, there is no more questions. Maybe they have some questions, but I just they are hesitating to ask. If you want, I can just uh, write your mail into our WhatsApp group, and if they have any questions, so they can ask you through the mail. Um, so I think that's the end of our presentation. I want to thank you for your time, for your effort, for helping us join the session. And that was great experience for SCGSU, holding the presentation with Sonor Lecturer. And um, so I think uh, that was great. I can't explain my feelings with the words, so I can text you through the, through the mail, through the WhatsApp. So that's it. Uh, yes. Thank you all. And hopefully you are able to watch the SEG president next week. I noticed you invited him. Yes, yes. So I'll yeah, be there. Be I'll, I'll join you if you let me. I'll be there. That's great. Everyone okay. are welcome to join the session. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Good day to Bye. everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye, teacher. Thank you so much.